Hi, my name is Kathy Rice, and I have decades of experience in coaching gymnastics, and I also have parented my own two kids. Uh, one went to Stanford on a gymnastics scholarship, and one went to Sacramento State, both very successful in the sport of gymnastics. I also coached an Olympian and have watched thousands of parents come through my gym and know that this is a really tough job. I know that I made my own mistakes in parenting. I just wanna help you in helping your child through this extremely difficult sport. Uh, the sport of gymnastics is very tough, but this can be used for any sport. Uh, just some things to keep in mind. So the coach's commitment to you as the parent. First, obviously, number one concern, we want everybody to be safe in the gym. That's an extremely important thing. They need to be safe mentally and physically in the gym. Um, the second most important goal to me is building their confidence and self-esteem. Sports inherently, especially something like the sport of gymnastics, can put down a kid over and over and over again. So when you're telling them what is wrong, what the correction is, what they need to improve, they can start feeling that they're not very good and that their self-esteem starts to be harmed. So it's real important that we build their confidence and self-esteem. So we don't constantly say, you know, your legs were bent, legs were bent again, and always saying the negative about what they're doing. Maybe we'll say something like, your legs were almost straight on that one. So phrasing things in a positive way is really important to build their confidence. We want to also teach progression safely at the rate that your child learns. So every child learns at a different rate. When they try to do something a little too early, it is detrimental for them in, in learning. So we want to learn at your child's rate and that is up to them. And we want to let them understand the progressions and skill building and feel confident when they are ready to go on to the next thing. This sport is so tough. So it never gets too easy. I, prob I promise you that we will always have a next challenge. So will you aid or will you harm this process? So the first thing in aiding it is you minimize the importance of this sport. I can't tell you how important that one thing is. When this is really important, when you're saying you gotta get to the next level, you gotta go in and practice, you can never miss, you need to do extra privates. When it's so important, it equals stress. So I try to tell parents whose kids are going through this kind of stress, is it's like trying to perform with eight bricks on your shoulders. Like it's very difficult when they're under stress. So we wanna make sure this is not the most important thing on earth. We also want to build them up, saying how much you love watching them. If you could say that over and over and over again and believe it, that you love watching them no matter what they do, I can tell you how much that builds up the self-esteem of those athletes. So they want to succeed. They have the freedom to succeed without worry about failing in your eyes. So really, really important if you could say you just love watching them no matter what they're doing. They could fall 10 times. You could be whatever level. It doesn't matter. I love watching you. That gives them the freedom to own their sport. Um, help them refocus on the process, not the results. So here's my favorite book. It is called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And this, I believe every parent, teacher, coach should read before they deal with their kids because it helped me so much with that perfectionist athlete, which we get so much in the sport of gymnastics, uh, refocus on the process of learning, not the results. Like it's not so important what they ended up with, it's what did you learn in that process? So that is what we really want to try to do is refocus on the process, not the necessarily, did you win? Did you move up? Results. So that's, a, that's so important. Some of the ways that you can help them focus on the process is talking about their effort or talking about how proud you were of listening to the coach or how proud you were that they were a good teammate, those kinds of things. Really important to, to think about those things instead of, did you win? Did you move up? Okay, some of the harm that you can do, obviously, we just talked about is focusing on the results. What place did you get? So say a kid goes into a competition and they get first all around, but they kind of actually didn't do that well, but the competition wasn't too tough, so they won all around. Now they go into the next competition, which is a really tough competition. They do a lot better, but they don't end up winning. So what do they think in their minds? Did they do well? Because they didn't win this time and last time they did. 
So you don't want to focus on those results. And always remember when they have the worst competition or things do not go well, that's when they learn the most. So having a perfect competition, they actually don't learn very much. So you can always focus on that. But hey, this gives you a chance to learn the most. So that's a great thing. Um, try not to ask leading questions. So did your friend get to practice more turns? Did Coach Haley give you corrections like she did to uh, Ava over there? No, that's not the kind of questions you want to give them. You want to tell them that they have the, the control, the power to get whatever they need from the coach. So don't ask them leading questions that make them feel victimized. Like, I thought, but did you like it that such and such got more turns warming up than you did on your vault? Uh, did you think that was fair? You know, those kind of things are not good for them because then they take takes the power away from them. You never want to take the personal responsibility away because once they feel victimized, guess what? It's out of my control to improve on vault. I can't. I get, shouldn't even bother trying to ask the coach if they could watch this turn or that turn because I'm already victim a victim of them not caring about me. So you don't want to put those thoughts into the kid's head. You want to give them the personal responsibility. Uh, never make their achievement tied to their worth. So very important that it's not about I got a nine, so that's why I get to have ice cream, that uh, it kind of is showing their love based on a result instead of on the process. So try not to, to do those kinds of things. And real quick about stress. Stress causes fear and mental blocks. And I cannot tell you how difficult mental blocks are. There, I have parents and kids in here agonizing over mental blocks. When they can do something and your kid can do something and they just won't go backwards or will not go for the skill, most stressful thing ever. And it makes the parents want to control it more. It makes the kid more anxious. And it just leads to more and more problems. Uh, also, a lack of confidence. We don't want these kids growing up to have any kind of lack of confidence. They, we don't want them to feel less than. We don't want them thinking of self-harm. We don't want any of those things to damage them as they're growing up because they've been told, you know, you didn't make it to this, you didn't do this, uh, your legs were bent on that, you know, just all the negative things that gymnastics can have in it. We don't want that to, to have any lack of confidence uh, in, inside them as they grow up. Uh, we say that this is sport is what they do, not who they are. And a lot of our sport can cause anxiety as an adult. And going back and, and thinking, if I'm not uh, succeeding, I'm a failure. And that's why we talk a lot about the process. Uh, your responsibilities as a parent. First, you want to find a balance between encouraging and pressure. Allow your child to compete or quit, obviously, with some discussion as they choose. So you're not the one in charge. You're trying to allow your child to make those decisions. They need to be empowered. They need to feel in charge of that. Understand what your child wants from the sport and be supportive of that goal. So sometimes they have a way higher goal than their abilities are. Sometimes they have a way lower goal than what they could be doing. Either way, it really does need to be their goal, not what you think they should do. Uh, set limits on your child's participation. Uh, make it part of their life, but also allow them to go on the vacations and to miss when they don't feel well or have uh, extreme homework, etc. But don't make this their entire life. You can never miss and you always have to be there 100 percent. It's so important. Uh, in fact, we need to do private lessons and add on to it. Keep winning in perspective and help your child do the same with the growth mindset. So always, like I talked about in the last slide, uh, the Carol Dweck book, please read this. It really helps in trying to get uh, the kids to think in the right way instead of on, in the stressful way. Uh, sports are a really good way to learn hard work and persistence can pay off because especially in this type of a sport where it's really tough and you have to do so many repetitions before you actually get good at something, it's a great way for them to learn that skill that if you keep working, it does pay off. And what a great skill that is. Help them be responsible also. Sports are a great place to begin to take personal responsibility. So you make sure that you're not part of taking that away from them. And don't be your co child's coach. I can tell you from personal experience, you should never coach your kid. I coached my own children. It was the worst mistake I've made in life. 
I would, my kids would have been a lot better off not having me involved. Uh, because that line of boundary between loving and supporting and lifting up your child and telling them what they did wrong, it's too blurred. It's not good for them. It makes them think their mom doesn't, mom or dad doesn't love me or doesn't think I'm as good because you're constantly coaching slash correcting them on what is wrong and what is no good. So you really have to try if at all costs, I would say just step back and I don't think anybody should coach their own kid. So how much should you be involved in their training? And we do want parents to be involved, but really we want it to be a very minimal level and supportive role because at home they need your support in so many different areas. But in the coaching world, in the gymnastics world, we don't want to have a huge involvement because of all the things that we just talked about. So you're... Uh, say a mom and um, your son or daughter equals 100%. Kind of silly, some silly graphics here, but your involvement plus your kids will equal 100%. So if, if you have your involvement 4%, it does not equal 104%. So whatever this number is on the 4% side, it will be reduced to equal 100%. That's just what we keep seeing over and over and over in the gym. But if you happen to do a little more involvement, like some of the parents have done, 40%, then what happens is the kid backs off. So it, it's a stupid, silly graphic, but what it is is to illustrate that the more you take ownership of the sport, the less the kid eventually starts doing. So they don't feel like it is their sport. They start backing off. They don't uh, take initiative, they don't ask questions, they don't try to do the things that they need to do to improve themselves because you're so involved and you're helping them that they just go, eh, it's not my thing. So they start backing off. So are you the conscientious parent? Like a lot of parents when they're doing this over involvement, including myself when I was raising my kids, thinking that if you're on top of things, you're the good parent, you're the conscientious parent, and you're the one who's trying to do the best for your child. But sometimes actually the kids who get the less, the least involved parents actually end up doing the best, which is strange, but that is how it is. So when you're in, thinking you're the conscientious parent, are you doing things like telling your kids what they should wear? Do you tell them what to do in their free time? Do you make your kid behave? Now that's a hard one because everybody wants their kid to behave properly, but you're not in control of making them behave, all you can do is guide them in that. Uh, communicate. Do you communicate for your child? Or are they learning the skills to communicate for themselves? Are you doing a lot of their homework or significantly helping them? Or is it mostly their responsibility and you're aiding with it? Are you calling the coach? Do you know their routines? Do you know what skills they're doing? Are you that involved? Do you know the other kids' scores or skills? Or are you that knowledgeable of everybody else's stuff and then do you come in and maybe tell the coach that my kid is bored and you're coming in to say hey I'm here to help my kid because they're bored one of the things with bored we've had this over the years so many times that they say stuff like my kid is bored so what it is it's a little bit uneducated in how difficult doing certain things perfectly is that's really really tough so we want to make sure when you say they're bored with a handstand, do they have a one minute perfect body shape handstand hold? If they're bored with it, that should be the result because a perfect handstand is an elite level skill and it's very, very, very difficult. So if they're bored with it, they should have that, right? <laughs> and most kids know. They get in a handstand, their head is out, they're arching their back, they're holding a handstand and they're like, I'm bored, I already have my handstand. Well, you don't have the handstand to the level that you need. Uh, in the very top level in elite gymnastics, we work on a round off every day. Well, if you're in a low level in gymnastics and you say, I already have my round off. No, we work a round off till the very, very end of their gymnastics career. It is such an important skill to master. And it is so difficult to master that it is not something that you should be getting bored with. So when you're the conscientious parent, uh, be careful that you're not overstepping in some of these areas that we need to help them learn and help them to improve on and help them understand being a partner with the coach and the athlete together. We make the best athletes.
So we want you to be a role model for your kids. Remember, you're likely to see your actions and words in your children. So watch out for that. And also watch out for the gossip that you might be talking about with other parents that actually feeds a lot of problems in the gym and they come back to your kids. So we want to try really hard not to, to engage in gossip. Uh, if you have concerns, always come right to the the owner or the coach and, and try to work on the issue with your child, not a, a gossip situation. We want to control your emotions in frustrating situations. If you see yourself get upset during a frustrating situation, guess what happens when the kid is frustrated? They will model that behavior. Uh, make sure you have a healthy attitude towards winning in sports and towards the other athletes. We should be only saying positive things about other athletes, other teams. When you're out there, you want to be that role model and saying it, the winning and the other teams, you know, we all, we don't really focus on the negative or on the result of winning. Uh, you always want to build your child's self-esteem. Self you will let, uh, you want to let your child know that he or she is important and valuable outside of any sports accomplishment. So important. An intense desire to win can produce fear of failure and subsequent low self-esteem. I left that whole statement in there because I thought it was so important. Don't spend time talking to the coach about meets, athlete skills, and how the coach conducts training. And please don't ever coach your child ever. If you have any concerns with anything, please do contact us. But don't spend your time talking about it with other people and uh, bad-mouthing anybody. It just doesn't work well for the entire training environment and building up that confidence and trust. Don't encourage your child to attend extra practices or private lessons unless they're asking you. They don't need to be pushed on this stuff. When you're doing that, you're again creating that most that this is so important. We have to address every little thing that you do wrong in gymnastics. We gotta get it fixed. Gotta get it fixed. We gotta get it fixed. It puts all this importance on them. And plus, almost all the best athletes that I've ever coached have never done a private lesson. So that's kind of just in the eye of who makes it long-term all the way towards the end, the best athletes, almost 95%, I would say, have never done a private lesson. Don't make insulting comments about other competitors or other parents or how the judges are or the coaches. Very important that you're modeling some good behavior. Okay, in many sports, there's body image issues and there is food. Food is a big problem for a lot of kids that they don't get raised with the right mentality about food. So when, with regards to food, please do not put your child on a weight loss diet. I know some parents who've had their kids intermittent fasting. I've had them doing things that they're not healthy at all will result in long-term problems with body image, weight, and sometimes eating disorders. Do not talk about good foods or bad foods or healthy foods and unhealthy foods. There's just food. You want to have a variety of food and you want to have everything in moderation. When you make something the bad food, guess what everybody wants? The bad food because they're not allowed to have it. Uh, don't make negative comments about your child's body or appearance. It's so damaging to the, to the kid. Um, it gives them low self-esteem. Uh, do not make those kind of comments about them. It's horrible. Don't praise your child's body. So say they say, oh, look how tiny your waist is. Don't value that. That is not a good thing because they will grow. And guess what? Then they're not as cute and tiny and little or whatever it is that you're praising. So don't do that. Uh, don't shame your child for their weight or withhold love because of this. That seems like a no-brainer, but some parents have done this kind of thing. And don't speak negatively about people in larger bodies or praise weight loss. So this is a really hard thing because our society so values thinness. And when somebody sees somebody's worked really hard to lose weight, they think that's a nice thing to do, to go praise them about their weight loss. But really what it does is it says to that person and to your child that it's better this way. And when you were a larger body, you weren't valued as much. So we really want to try to change that culture and society so these kids don't grow up thinking small body and thin body is good and bigger body is bad. And we want to have a healthy mentality and attitude about food. Really, really important. So some of you will 
have younger kids and this, some of this stuff might not be exactly uh, useful yet, but this is a great parenting webinar. I just did a few excerpts on it. Uh, the full webinar can be found on USAG's website. It's a really good webinar in parenting. So I wanted to play you have some in your of head it of The you. kind of mom or dad you want to be is not what shows up every day. And so I think it's important for us to admit we should have a vision in our head of what the ideal relationship looks like, sounds like, and feels like. Because this relationship, well, not only is it important, but we want it to be long lasting. So that's part of a, a child's quality world. And when, when, when those people are missing, then that means part of his quality world is missing. The second thing would be the things we most want to own or experience. See that it works it also makes up for their quality world. So these are the three things that a child longs for, even if it's on a subconscious level. The people they most want in their life, the things they want to own or experience, and a system of beliefs that they can use to govern their world. So now along comes this person called mom or dad, who is older and of course wiser, and we think to ourselves, I know what's best for you. And most of the time, we're right. We do know what's best for our children. But the problem comes when we change that to, now, how do I get you to do what I want you to do? So I'm starting to paint a picture for you here of what threatens relationships with our children. Before we can solve the problem and, and make it bulletproof, we have to understand what is undermining these relationships we have with our kids. So once we realize that we as parents are wiser, older, did you ever see the movie Matilda? Danny DeVito is the dad, and he, and he says to his little girl, look, do what I tell you to do. I'm big, you're little. I'm smart, you're dumb. And that's his whole attitude toward his child. Of course, the funny thing about the movie is that his daughter is much wiser than he is. But once a parent takes on this position, now how do I get you to do what I want you to do? This becomes an issue of control. And the child will find themselves, especially as they approach the teenage years, suffering from some misery because what they're thinking is, how can I live my own life but still get along with these people I need? I need and love my parents, but I'm having so much trouble getting along with them because they keep trying to make me do stuff I don't want to do. Now, I want you to, to think carefully about this sense. How do I get you to do what I want you to do? In other words, what tactics can I use to force, manipulate, or bribe you into doing what I want you to do? And the child's response to that, because every child at some point in their life wants to experience autonomy. That means they want to have a sense of ownership and control over their life. How can I live my own life and still get along with these people I desperately need in my quality world? So what happens, unfortunately, is this battle goes on between what parents know is best for their kids and their need for autonomy and control, the need to be right takes priority over the health of the relationship. This is the first sign of, of a crumbling relationship when we as parents feel that we have to be right on all issues. And we have to be right all the time. It takes priority over even the health of the relationship. So let's play this out a little bit. Let's see where this goes. It leads to one of two of the possible psychologies in the world. There's two possible psychologies. One is called external control. And it goes like this, punish the people who are doing wrong so they will do what we say is right. And then reward them so they keep doing what we want them to do. This fundamental psychology has to do with uh, carrot and stick, or in this case, belt, right? Um, and the carrot and stick mentality plays off the fundamental truth that uh, all human beings respond to pain and pleasure. So if I make you uncomfortable enough, if I treat you to enough discomfort or pain, I can hopefully get you to do what I want you to do. Or if I put an attractive enough carrot out in front of you, perhaps I can manipulate you to do what I want you to do by use of this carrot. So as this plays out, the, the unintended consequence is that it destroys personal freedom. 
we end up creating in our children a belief that others can make them feel the way they feel and make them do the things that we want them to do. Of creating an opportunity for wise choices in our children instead of controlling them. So here's rule number one. The only person's behavior we can control is our own. The only person's behavior we can actually control is our own. Rule number two, all we can give and receive from others is information, choice, because everything we then think, do, or say is actually a choice. Our responses to the information we get from other people is actually a choice. We choose to be angry. We choose to be jealous. We choose to be sad. We choose to be happy. Everything we think, say, or do is actually a choice. And yet we will go on in our relationships trying to get people to do what we want them to do. And they will claim that we made them do it. He says, don't choose to do anything with a child whom you want to grow up to be happy, successful, and close to you. Don't do anything with that child that, would, that you believe will increase the distance between you. Now, I caution you here. He's not saying that you shouldn't ever discipline a child. He's not saying that. He's not saying that you shouldn't ever correct a child or provide guidance. He's not saying you shouldn't provide boundaries, even, even some non-negotiables. Talk about where there's room for choice and where there's not. If we're going to give our children choices, it should actually be over things where they can learn a lesson. For instance, bedtime. Some families go to war every night over bedtime. And there's a pretty sound argument that says, well, why don't we teach our children to figure out what bedtime is best for them? As long as they're in their room quiet and not disturbing anyone, if they aren't ready to go to sleep yet, that's fine. But we can give them the choice to fall asleep when you want to. You just have to be in your room and be quiet, reading, or something like that. And you can set guidelines around that. But to go to war over bedtime, oh my goodness, how painful and necessary. Same thing with this whole idea of the clean play club. Now, what I've seen done that I think made so much more sense because I grew up in a family where, you know, my grandfather used to say, hey, you got to belong to the clean play club. That means you have to eat everything on your plate. And so did my wife. And, and, and her brother would sit at the table with some of his vegetables still there and would purposely not eat them because he – was determined not to be controlled. And he literally was told, you'll, you'll sit there until you eat those vegetables. And he would sit there for three hours and not eat them because he was in a power struggle with his parents over those last few bites of green beans. Well, what good did that do anybody but drive a wedge of resentment and resistance between him and his parents? So let's teach our kids to take the portion of food that they think they need right? And if they don't eat it, once dinner's cleaned up, no, there, are, there isn't any more food. We had dinner and it's gone now. So you need to eat your meal at dinner so that you have adequate nourishment to get through the rest of, you know, until the next meal. It doesn't mean you have to then all of a sudden wait on them and correct, you know, create new meals because they didn't eat when the food was there. Uh, even clothing, you know, what to wear to school. My son went to school with um, a couple of, of boys whose mother dressed them all the way through middle school and into high school. Mom picked out their clothes every single day. They had no choice. Now, my son wanted to wear um, costumes to school when he was in, you know, like kindergarten. He wanted to go as Batman, Superman, Robin Hood, you know, you name it. He wanted to wear different costumes. And so we didn't want to rob him of his choice. So what we did is we put parameters around it. On one part of the closet were all the costumes, and we said, these are not school clothes. But over here on the other side of the closet are all the clothing that's appropriate for school. So you can choose anything you want to from this side of the closet where there's school clothing, but not from this side. Go ahead and feel powerful, but only from this side of the closet. Let children choose their clothing. These are areas where we can give them that sense of choice, autonomy, 
some freedom, and it can still have boundaries around it. We can say bedtime is, is any time, you know, from 8.30 to 10. You decide when you're sleepy, but at 9 o'clock, we're all going to bed, and you must be in your room and be quiet, and you can stay awake until you feel tired. When kids go to school the next day and they stayed up too late, eventually they start to figure it out. What about the non-negotiables? This is just as important a list. There are certain things that are non-negotiable. Going to school is not a choice. It's clear from the beginning that we are going to school, and we're going to go to school on time. This is not one of the areas where you have choice. Safety issues is another area that is a non-negotiable because it is in everyone's best interest that we honor these safety things like wearing your seat belt or getting in the car seat, all of those things. And, and pretty soon there's no battle over it because it's, it's just not one of the choices. But if there are other choices, then we don't have to go to war over these choices. Health concerns, these are non-negotiables. When it's time to if, you know, get a vaccination, go to the doctor for a checkup, whatever it might be, going to the dentist, the health concerns are not optional, in whatever your family decides and what your family practices are. So I guess the point of this page is just to point out that we can have certain things where there's room for choice and other things that are non-negotiable. My wife, just to, to share with you the difference between how my wife and I think, she was always bothered by the fact that my son's bedroom wasn't very neat and tidy. In fact, it looked a little bit more like a dumpster exploded in there much of the time. And I had a different perspective. My rule was never create work for someone else. In our common areas of the house, you're not welcome to leave your shoes or your coat or your underwear or anything else, your socks. Do not create work for other people in the common areas of the house. You must be respectful of that. What you do in your own room is up to you, and you will have to live with the degree of organization that you've decided to have in your room. It is your room. That was my attitude. So we had a little struggle, my wife and I, over this because I said this is his area. Let him choose. The thing that's so interesting about it is that now, um, you know, a couple of years ago, he got his his own, uh, you know, his first real career after college. Got his own apartment, and we went over to visit. And guess what? He keeps his apartment extremely organized, neat, and clean. And I think to myself, I'm so glad that I didn't go to war over and over and over again when he was in grade school and middle school. We taught him what a neat and tidy organized house can look like and the benefits of that by the way we kept our areas. But our conversations, <clears throat> let's take a look at external control conversations versus choice theory alternatives. Here's an example. If you've heard yourself say this, how many times do I have to tell you bedtime is 9 o'clock? No, uh, no television night if you don't go right to bed now. So there's the threat. Did you hear the threat? The threat is no television tomorrow night if you don't go to bed right now. The choice theory alternative would sound like this. As long as you're quiet and you don't disturb anyone, you can go to bed when you get sleepy. But before I get too sleepy, would you like me to read with you? So in other words, we're providing an alternative that could accomplish the same thing. Would you like me to read with you? Here's another example. You wanted the dog. Well, I'll tell you, I'm sick and tired of walking the dog. She's, she's going to the pound if you don't start taking better care of her. Once again, a threat in order to get someone to do what you want them to do. What would an alternative be? We have a dog. I love her, and I'm not going to get rid of her, but I am tired of being the only one who walks her or being told, I'll do it later. The dog needs some care. Now, how can we work out this problem? So there's something that has to be worked out. We're not going to use a threat, but we're going to make the child aware that they have a responsibility to help out with this. How are we going to fix this problem? Here's a common one. Do your homework now. I don't care what it is. You have to do it or no video games. Again, the, the threat, uh, some kind of manipulation. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. Let's look at that homework. Let's look it over together to see if you understand it. And I'll be here to help you if you get stuck. 
See, that's a different kind of invitation. It's a whole different environment around the homework issue. And I've talked to parents who said that they they go to war over, over homework every night. You know, one one mom told me she, you know, she'd sit at the kitchen table right after dinner with her child for two or three hours battling, trying to make him do his homework. You know, a better choice would be let's teach them early on how important doing homework is and then let them choose the consequences that come from from doing homework or not doing it. And I believe the teachers should deliver the consequences, both the good ones and the unpleasant ones for not doing your homework. I never wanted to to stress my relationship with my child over doing the homework or not doing it. Um, I want to be there to help and support, but I want them to learn to take responsibility for it. Oh, here's here's one that's sensitive for some folks. Are you crazy? No child of mine will ever get her nose pierced. Um, there, there are a number of different ways to handle this, but here's just one example. Get anything pierced you want. My love for you doesn't depend on what you look like. But wait a minute, don't do it until I get a good picture of the way you are right now. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> kind of subtle, right? <laughs> like an anvil. So all this is is to show you that there are there are some really creative ways that we can have conversations with our kids that don't include threats. The problem with threats is that we always create a resentment and resistance. Kids know when they're being threatened. You use it as a last resort. You don't want it to be your your basic MO, what you do every single time. I don't want to end up with a solution that damages our relationship. The relationship is more important to me than this issue. Now that's real big boy and big girl stuff, okay? Because if either party does not treat the relationship itself as one of the most sacred things in the solving circle, then people will fight to the death just to have their own way. I want to be right and I need you to be wrong. But a solving circle says our relationship is the most important thing. It's bigger than this issue. So let's always keep our relationship in mind because we won't want to we don't want to sacrifice that. I hope that makes sense to you. Glasser's quote really struck me. He said, it is our attempt to control that destroys the only thing we have with our children that gives us some control over them. And that's our relationship. Read that. Read that. Do you hear what it says? It's our attempt to control that destroys the one thing we have that gives us some control. In other words, the security of the relationship, the integrity of the relationship, the, the, um, you know, the power of the relationship actually gives us some influence over our kids that uh, can be very beneficial to them. Oof, so there's a lot of information in there and I uh, hope you got something out of it. I think it's a great webinar. So uh, if you want to see the whole thing, you can go to USAG's website. Quick summary, in order for the athlete to have success, all three parts of the triangle need support and we must work together. So the athlete, the parents, and the coach all need to be, have support. The athlete needs to be mostly in charge of their sport and learn the three Ps, which are positivity, personal responsibility and perseverance. Those three Ps help them succeed in anything they'll do. So it's a great lesson to learn early. Parents need to build the child up, support them at home, try to work on the growth mindset and getting the kid to focus on process, not so much the results. And coaches need to encourage, guide and motivate the child to reach the goal without pressuring or pushing and build self-esteem so that they progress at the best rate for that child. And like I said, every athlete develops at a different rate. It's when we push them into a place they're not comfortable when they really start seeing problems. And when we do too much importance on the sport, that's when we really see the problems. Thank you for watching uh, this seminar. And if you have any questions, you're free to contact me. My email is jimcats at jimcats.com. I would love to help out with any parents so they don't make some of the mistakes I have made. Thank you so much.